Good evening to everyone. Wait, wait. That was weak. Should we try it again? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, whenever I get introduced this way, as uh, Rabbi Yonatan just did, um, I have one regret. And the regret is that Mrs. Silver wasn't here to hear it. Uh, and I don't mean my wife, Gail, because she's here. I mean my mother, Aleha Shalom, because she's the only one that believes all those things. <laughs> I have to say that uh, the chauffeur, as you all know, plays a very special role. A special role in our lives, and especially around this time. The Rambam, when he speaks about the mitzvah of chauffeur, he opens by saying, really, it's Gzerat HaKatuv. This is the way the Almighty wanted it to be, and that's why we blow a chauffeur on Rosh Hashanah. But then he says, there is a remez. There is a hint. And that hint is, Uru Yesheni Mishenaschem. Wake up, you sleepy heads. Wake up from your slumber. Nirdomim and those that are drowsing. Hakitsu Mitarde Maschem. Wake up. Look into your actions. And you should do tshuva. Return with tshuva. And remember the one who created you. Now, what does it mean to wake up? What does it mean wake up? I know in America, I don't know what the mix is here, English, South African, American, but in America, there is, a, um, there is a coffee called Folger's Coffee. And Folger's had this big, big persomet, this big advertisement. The best thing about waking up is Folger's in your cup. Uh, they didn't mean in the cup, but they meant in the cup. Is that what it means to wake up? What does it mean to wake up? So the Rambam tells us who has to wake up. All those elu, hashochechim esoemes, those who forget the truth. Bahavle hazman, by wasting their time and being involved in meaningless and empty activities. The Torah, the chauffeur is telling us to, to look into our, to our lives, look into our actions, look into who we are, and wake up introspection of what we're doing and where we're going. And then we'll do tshuva. Now, it's a very interesting thing. When the Torah teaches us about tshuva, there's a parsha satshuva. And right after the parsha satshuva, the Torah says like this, ki ha mitzvah hazos, this mitzvah, asher anochi mitzavcho hayom lo nifleisi bibcho. It's not mysterious, nor is it far away from you. In your mouth, in your heart, to do it. The Ramban and most of the Mephorshim learn when it says, Ki mitzvah hazos, you know what mitzvah it's talking about? The mitzvah of tshuva. Now let's be honest, it's easy to do tshuva. What are you telling me? It's nearby, it's here, you can do it. You don't have to go up to heaven, you don't have to go across the sea. It's not easy to do tshuva. Why do we find it so difficult? And we know it's so crucial. So what is it that doesn't allow us to do tshuva properly? I would like to say like the Rambam is saying, we're not honest with ourselves. One of our major problems with tshuva is that we're constantly rationalizing. There are things that we simply do not want to see and we don't want to think about. I'm going to tell you a story. A friend of mine, a very famous Baal tshuva, who has brought thousands and thousands of Jews back home and he told me that during the Yom Kippur War, when he was in the army, I think in Miluim even, they were stationed in the Negev, in the desert, and they were sleeping in a tent, this unit, this group of soldiers. 
And they woke up one morning, and you know what they found? A tsefa. That's a, a, the, most, the most poisonous snake that there is in this land was coiled on the back of one of the soldiers while he was still sleeping. And they told him, don't move. They woke him up, obviously, and told him, don't move. Whatever you do, don't move. And meanwhile, they're scratching their heads. What are they going to do? So they had only one, one Eitzah that they had. The only thing they could do was they were going to shoot it off his back. And one of the guys there was a Tzalaf. He was a sharpshooter. And it was his job to shoot the snake off the back of this soldier. You can imagine how everybody was with tension. And then there was one soldier in the group that said, you know what? I know we're not religious. But you know what? Let's all say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Before he shoots, we need a little help. Someone to guide that bullet. And they all together said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And as soon as they said it, the snake uncoiled itself and crawled onto the ground and they shot it dead. So they turned to the Salaf. They turned to the sharpshooter and they said to him, after all of this, did you become a Balchuva? He says, what are you talking about? Me? He says, the snake wasn't on my back. <laughs> yeah. How many of us go through those kinds of motions? The snake isn't on my back. So much is happening. There's so much that the world is experiencing today. And as long as it's not me, I don't have to wake up. Reb uh, Chaim Friedlander, who was the Mashkiach in Konevesh, after Rav Dessler, he was in Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York, and everybody knows what they do. And he was under treatment for the illness that eventually took his life. Elul, he wrote a letter to his Talmidim. He wrote a letter to all of his students. And he explained the Pesach in the Torah that I think is so crucial for us to know as we are getting closer to Rosh Hashanah. And he said like this, Rosh Hashanah is not mentioned in the Torah. Nowhere in the Torah do we find the word Rosh Hashanah at all, except there's one reference when speaking about Eretz Yisrael and describing Eretz Yisrael, says the Torah, Eretz asher Hashem elokecha dorei shoiso, tomid einei Hashem elokecha bo. It's a land that Hashem is always concerned with and His eyes are always upon it. And then it says, May reishis shona ad achmet, reishis hashona ad achris shona. So they learn reishis hashona, obviously it's Rosh Hashona. But it's not spelled like we spell Rosh Hashona, it's spelled without an aleph. It's spelled mem reishin yud tov, may reishit. So the Gemara, the Gemara teaches us in Rosh Hashanah, Omar Rabbi Yitzchak, says Rabbi Yitzchak, Kol Shona She Rosha, Rosha in terms of Rosh, meaning poor, without the Aleph. She Rosha Bitchilosa Mit Asheret Besofa. Any year that when you begin the year, like we are about to do on Rosh Hashanah, and one is feeling poor, needy, wanting, he will merit to have a blessed year. We have to come to the Yom Adin with this understanding that anything I've merited up until this point is no longer coming to me. We think we have our homes, we have our families, we have our friends, our health, our talents. But in reality, you have to know when you come to Rosh Hashanah, you got to begin all over again you got to merit your talent. you got to merit your family. you got to merit your health. Rosh Hashanah, a year that is poverty-stricken, meaning if you come with a recognition that Hashem, I have nothing, and I want you to give it to me, and I know you're the only one that can. And the Balaturim says something very beautiful there, because you take the word Mei Reishit, without the Aleph, Mem Reishin, Yutaf, it also spells May Tishrei. So it's talking about Rosh Hashanah. 
And it's telling us, if we approach the Yom Adim in this way, then we have a chance of a favorable judgment. Our lives, as you all know, are hanging by a thread. Literally by a thread. And what it means is that we can do, really do nothing without HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The last day of Moshe Rabbeinu's life, the Torah says, Vayelech Moshe, we'll read it next week. Vayelech Moshe, and Moshe went and he spoke these words to the Bnei Yisrael, says the Medrash Tanchuma, Vayelech Moshe, this whole saga was a rebuke to Klau Yisrael. And everybody asks, what's the rebuke? Moshe went, Vayelech Moshe. Where's the rebuke? So the Medrash Rabbah tells us like this. It's in the next Pasuk that says, Ben Meo Ve'esrim Shono Anoichi Hayom. I'm 120 years old, says Moshe today. Lo Uchalot says Levilavo. And I can't, any longer I can't go and come as I did. Hashem Omar Eli Lo Savor Es Hayardein Azer. You're not going to cross the, the Yardein, says Hashem. Klai Yisrael looked at Moshe Rabbeinu, they couldn't understand. Yesterday, Moshe Rabbeinu was soaring like an eagle to Shamayim. He was interacting with HaKadosh Baruch Hu directly. He was the greatest leader. He was a man who took all of Klal Yisrael and elevated all of all 600,000 of Klal Yisrael, three million of them. And now, he can't even cross the Jordan. That's the Tochacha. Today, we think we can do whatever we want. Oh, boy. What's going to be when tomorrow we wake up and we no longer can? Only if we realize that everything is in Hashem's hands can we appreciate what we have and what we have to ask for. Somebody once told me the amazing thing. You want to feel good? You want to feel great? So I have a great piece of advice. Go to the hospital and go to the information desk and tell them, I want to go, I want the number of the room where Yehuda Silver is uh, a patient. So they look up and say, Yehuda, we don't have any Yehuda Silver in the hospital. Oh, you'll go away feeling great. <laughs> you'll go away feeling wonderful. Thank God. Isn't that an amazing thing? Gemara tells us like this, there were two people who were both ill, very ill. And they were both in bed, dying. And they turned to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, And they davened. They davened to Hashem. One was healed, and the other one was not. And he died. He gives a number of a couple examples of people who were uh, going to be executed. They both prayed. One was hung, the other was not. So the Gemara says, why? They both davened. So the Gemara answers that the one who didn't make it did not have a tshuva shleima, a, a tefillah shleima, excuse me. His, his tefillah wasn't complete, whole. So Rashi explains, what does it mean, a, a tefillah shleima? Says Rashi, one word, kavana. Kavana. The one that davened, he had kavan. The one that didn't, make it, I mean, they both daven. The one that made it had kavana. The one that didn't make it didn't have kavana. Can you explain to me what that means? Two people are lying in bed, they're ill, they're sick. So one's praying, davening, and he has kavana. And the other one, what's he thinking about? Pizza? You know, what's he doing? Of course he's talking to Hashem. He knows he's talking to Hashem. But here I heard an amazing idea. The one who didn't make it, of course, was davening to Hashem to heal him. But he had a lot of faith in the doctors and the medicine, too. He didn't perceive that it was only in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's hands. Only in his hands. Whereas the one who davened with a tefillah shleima, oh boy, did he know he was in Hashem's hands. And that's all that mattered. And because of that reality of being awake in a spiritual way, that's how he got through. We have to realize that what is it that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants of us? He wants one thing, that we should know we're in the Shema. 
Know that you're in the shamo. You look in the mirror, you say, oh, that's me. That's not you. That's your dress, the clothes you're wearing, the garment, the physical garment. But where is the you? Who are you? You're in the shamo. And the more you get in touch with that neshama, the greater your connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the greater the impact of your tshuva. And the uh, Tzodak HaKohen says something that if he didn't write it, I would be afraid to say it. But I'm going to share with you his words and hear them and try really to, to, to incorporate them into, into your heart. Says Reb Tzodik, Kishem Shetzorich Odom Lahamim Bahashem Yisborach. Just like every person has to believe in Akadosh Baruch Hu, Kach Tzorich Achakach Lahamim Baatzmo. You gotta believe in yourself. What do you gotta believe about yourself? Ratzalomar, Sheyesh Lahashem Yisborach Eisekimo. Hashem wants to be involved with him. Shenafsho Bomi Mekorachayim. He comes from the source of all life, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's who you are. The Hashem mitanegu Hashem takes pride and pleasure within you. That's someone, that's what we have to realize, that we're Deshamas. There's a very amazing story I'll share with you. Maybe one or two. There was a great Makarov, a person who was a worked very hard in Kirov for many years and was in the car of thousands of people and he had a terrible accident and he was killed. At his Levaya, they told a little bit of the story of his life and how he came into Kirov. Before, in his previous life, he had a very nasty um, store in the heart of Tel Aviv with all kinds of obscene pictures and pornographic material. And one day, you know, he, he's, the pro, he's the proprietor. So people were walking by, men, even women, and everybody that walked, up, walked by took a look in the window, looked at the pictures, and went on. Or went in, whatever. And then one day, there was this fellow, I, I'll describe him to you, he had a black hat on, probably a white shirt and a black suit, and a, a big book under his arm. And he was walking by the store, and he, he took a glance, and he just kept on going. Everybody else stood there for a while. But he kept on going. So they brought out at, the, at this Laban's Levaya, after 120 years, when this yeshiva bucher will come up to Shamayim, they'll come and say, welcome, welcome, the great Mekarev. And this fellow's in the Shom will say, I was sitting and learning all day long. I never had anything to do with Kiruv. But it was you that opened the eyes of this man and brought him to Yiddishkeit by his searching, and as a result, he was able to be Mekar of hundreds of people. You get the credit. That's someone whose neshama is alive. That's someone, someone who's in touch with his neshama. So what does Hashem want from us? The Pesach tells us clearly, that's exactly what the Rambam was saying in the beginning. Go into your heart. Do tshuva within your own heart. Hashevosa, return to you. We say no lenu. Yodata hayom. Vahashevosa levavecha. It's a posik in the No, of course. But without bringing it into your emotional realization, without bringing it down into your neshama, into your heart, it will remain there and it won't be effective. And after that, v'shavto ad Hashem elokecha then you can return all the way to reach HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. Then you can reach Hashem. If we first, as we said, wake up, if we first look at things with a sense of, 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 of truth and reality, then, then we have a chance of going and doing and creating with our tshuva, Ad Hashem Elokech. Let's give you an example of somebody that really was involved, completely immersed in his own self-introspection and was not fooling himself. And that was the Munkacher Rebbe. The Munkacher Rebbe instilled in his followers an enormous belief in the coming of Mashiach. And he had a very, very close relationship with Reb Shloim Eliezer Alfandri, 
who was a big mekubal, he was here in Yerushalayim. Well, Beit Shemesh is kind of close to Yerushalayim. But he was here in Eretz Yisrael in Yerushalayim, Reb Shlomo Eliezer, Alfandri. And the, he was called the Saba Kadisha, the Holy Zayde. And this Rune Kacha Rebbe held that the Saba Kadisha was his Rebbe in Nistar, in Kabbalah, and he literally longed to meet him. In 1930, he finally came to Eretz Yisrael to meet his mentor, to meet what he called his Rebbe. And of course, he came with great pomp and circumstance, and everybody came to greet the Munkach Rebbe. And then he came to the Saba Kadisha, and he spoke to him for a few minutes, and everybody was around trying to hear what's going on, and finally they went into a private room. Now the Rebbe's Gabai couldn't help himself. He put his ear to the door to hear the conversation between the, the Munkacha Rebbe and his Rebbe. And this is what he heard. Tagidli bevakasha. Mashiach. When's Mashiach coming? And the Gabbai listened. He listened intently. And he said, and the, and the Saba Kadisha said, there are those, Yesh Mishima There are those who are holding back the Gula. And the Rebbe uh, listened, the Gabbai listened again, and finally he heard with bitter tears coming from the Mukacha Rebbe. And he said like this, Haim gamanim min hamakvim es ha-gula. Am I too someone who is holding back the gula? That's a person who believes how important it is to look inside, into their hearts. We too have to make sure that we're not doing something that is stopping the gula. And that we're not, not doing something that would bring the gula. Who knows? I say this all the time. Mashiach didn't come in Rashi's door. He didn't come in, in the Rambam's door. He didn't come in the Vilna Gon or the Besh door. Why is he going to come by us? And they're all saying we're in the Ikhvus of Mashiach. So why, why, why us? No, we're so holy. Rashi wasn't holy enough. And his door wasn't great enough. And the answer is, it's nothing to do with us. It's cumulative. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is adding together all of those Doros, Rashi, Rambam, Rif, Ran, Ritva, Tilnagon, all the Tzaddikim, and putting them all together, and it's ot, 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 full. And maybe the next bracha you make is going to bring the Mashiach. Or Chas Shalom, the next Avera we do, is going to hold back the Mashiach. That's what the Munkacha Rebbe was teaching us. I want to tell you one more story. And this is a very touching story. To me, it, it shook me up to my core. There was a little girl who was very ill, and she needed uh, antibodies uh, from an infusion that only her little brother, she was, must have been eight, he was five, her little brother had these antibodies, and they needed to get blood from him to give to her in order to help her fight the infection that she was fighting was attacking her. And when they went over to him, they said, uh, they, they told him what they need to do, and they asked him, they asked him, would you be prepared to give your blood to your sister? So he thought about it. He thought about it for a while. And then he said, yes, I'll be happy to. So they brought him both to the hospital. They took the infusion. They took the blood from the little boy put it into girl immediately as soon as his blood was entered they saw a great difference in her uh, whole situation and then she was she was more alert and she was you could see it made a difference and everybody was smiling including the brother everybody was happy and then after a few minutes the little boy had a very sad look on his face so the doctors went over to him and said uh, why 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 what's the matter why why are you so sad and he said, well, when do I die? Because he thought that by giving his blood, that's what's going to happen. Now we know why he was prepared to think about it a bit. It's a five-year-old boy where a neshama is truly alive. 
Now, we've got to begin to, to connect with that. We know it's a tough battle. You know, we'll come to Rosh Hashanah and we'll say, oh, yeah, I didn't do tshuva. Yeah, last year I tried. I really wanted to. I made up my mind I'm going to. And look where I am. I'm, I'm at the same place in the same way, and I'm not doing anything different than I should be doing different, and I'm not, then it's the same all over again. And my Rabbi Rav Hutner Zuchan Tzadik Levrocha told his Talmidim, and he said, it's not the war. It's the battle. It's the battle, each battle. Every time you're able to overcome that Yetzirah on whatever level, that's a phenomenal achievement. And he goes on to say, when we speak about our G'dol Le'olam, the Chofetz Chaim, everybody speaks about how pure his mouth was, how his Lashon was so totally and completely dedicated to only speaking what needs to be spoken according to Allah. But nobody tells us about the battles that the Chofetz Chaim had to get there. He didn't, wasn't born with it. He had a battle to get there. And oh boy, did he battle. And look at what he achieved. It's not the war. Because if we lose a battle here and we lose a battle there, but ultimately, that's where we're judged, is in that battle. Sheva pomim yipol tzaddik v'kom, says Shlomo HaMelech. A tzaddik falls seven times and he gets up. So we think that's a description of what a tzaddik does. Not so, says Rav Hutner. Sheva tzaddik, sheva pomim yipol tzaddik v'kom means that's how he became a tzaddik. You become a tzaddik by falling and getting up again, falling and getting up again. But bearing one thing in mind, and that is, when we speak about tshuva, we're not saying, I'm going to be better tomorrow. I'll be a little bit different, to, but prove myself tomorrow. Says the Roshiba, you know what you have to say? Tomorrow I'm going to be different. I'm going to change. It's not me. And the Rambam clearly says it because he lists the, the, very clearly that a person who was about tshuva, if they called him Ruvay, now he maybe should change his name because he has to have a different identity. We have to know that we can become different. We can become different husbands. Well, there are none here except me, but no, oh, a few. Uh, why? Different wives, different parents, different children, different neighbors different family, we can be different. And that's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants on this Rosh Hashanah. Listen to that chauffeur saying, look into yourself, but honestly, and see where are the areas that you want to be different. I got the message. <laughs> so, in conclusion, Sometimes the chauffeur comes in different ways, you know? <laughs> so in conclusion, let me just say to you this. this uh, people who come together to hear words of Torah, words of Isarus before the Yom Hadin, know that the Almighty is looking down at this gathering right now. And he's full of pride. He's full of pride. Because people want to come together and, and not just sit around but to try to somehow find a way to change, to be different. And that's our goal. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu give us a bracha and the hatzlocha and the koach to do a proper tshuva. And when we daven, to daven with a tefillah shlema, that we know that we're talking to the only koach in the world that can do anything for me and for the entire world. We're in a tough situation in the world. I don't have to go into it. It doesn't, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is talking to us on every, every level. It doesn't take a suicide bomb or a God forbid a beheading or God forbid all the threats against Kal Yisrael or all the stupid things that wise people do and say that you can't believe. Why would they make such decisions? And the answer is because they're not. The Rabbani Shalom is. And if we have that, we have that in our mind, then Amir Hashem, with that sincere commitment, will be Zoha to Aksiva Bachasima Tova, Lauter Lachaim Tovim, Besoch Kol Klaw Yisrael.